we're talking about scams in a way or you know things that yeah you know, doesn't look very clean so what about the the treasury debt and the fiscal deficit i mean in the us isn't isn't too too far fetched to say okay but Isn't this another way of scamming people, you know, uh, with all this future inflation that nobody really knows um, how it's going to be paid? Well, some claim, um, I was hearing Mohamed Eledian, and he said, okay, the market is like saying, okay, we don't really know how it's going to be solved, but we, we still think that in some way it's going to be solved. But the bond market, you know, it, It's still com complacent, right? Yeah. So uh, here's the thing, right? <laughs> the U.S. is in a unique position, right? Because they're the global reserve currency, right? And although that's eroding somewhat, they're still by and large overwhelming the global reserve currency. I go here in Argentina, everyone wants $100 bills. Big face, not small face, right? But they want their $100 <laughs> bills, right? And that's all over the world. People who hoard $100 bills, uh, it's used to settle most oil trades still, right? The petrodollars. Um, and that gives the United States a massive advantage economically and the ability to essentially print as much money as they want because people always soak up the dollars. Try that in Argentina, it creates hyperinflation. Any other country would create hyperinflation. In the United States, it doesn't because they have the whole world by using their dollars, Right. Um, which is why I think that it was so foolhardy for the Biden administration to freeze Russia's assets because all it did is it drove Russia into the arms of China and really forced them to come up with this, to accelerate this BRICS idea, which is to come up with a different form of currency that wasn't reliant on dollars. So that's, that, that thing was a huge error because I think what the U.S. was to ever lose its position as a global reserve currency, it's over. Then it's game over. It's hyperinflation and the market crashes. The U.S. does have one thing going for it, the Navy SEALs. I mean, like, it's military. So, like, you know, the U.S. is the most aggressive military, dom I mean, you know, we're going bombing everybody. You know, it, we, we're always in a war or, or, or backing someone in a war, right? So, I, and I think part of that is that, you know, the U.S. is trying to maintain its, its hegemony around the world. They're trying to maintain their dominance as the, as the world's sole superpower. But, you know, really, there's, it's, a, it's a bipolar world now with China as well and not as powerful as the U.S. yet. But the U.S. is so keen on maintaining that dominance that I believe they would militarily go out there and try to – if they thought that it was going to endanger the dollar, they'd militarily intervene, well, certainly. Uh, apparently, Saddam Hussein started yeah. to sell oh, oil they, in and, euros. And there you go, right? Okay, right. right? And that's, so you, you, you right. can kill as many and, Kurders, and, Kurds as, as you want, but you cannot sell oil in exactly, euros. Exactly, You right? cannot do that. Exactly. The same Mosebek back before the Shah of Iran, right? He wanted to nationalize the oil and not out the British and, you know, he got overthrown by the CAA back in the 50s, right? And they installed the Shah. That's been happening time and time again, right? But I, and, but I, I think there's also another aspect to this as well. And that is that, you know, I, I really believe that one thing Trump should clarify a lot more in his policy is the fact that Elon Musk is going to go in there and do a malay Um, to do uh, to be a verb, a malay, and slash and burn and get rid of all the ridiculous waste and cut trillions of dollars of overhead from the U.S. government. And I believe that if if Musk is allowed to go in there and really do this, to go in there and optimize the federal government, get rid of the waste, you could talk about a trillion dollars, two trillion a year, seriously, in savings, and at the same time cut taxes, loosen regulations. Increase, which would increase GDP dramatically, drive massive GDP growth. So even on a lower tax basis, your, your proceeds, your income is going to be higher. So now you're dramatically reducing expenses, increasing income from taxes because you're still on a much higher, a much higher GDP, okay? You could start having a massive surplus each year versus a deficit. The U.S. does that for 10, 15 years. It's out of debt. So I think this whole aspect of, of, of uh, Elon Musk coming in there and slashing and burning, he went to, into Twitter and cut like 80% of the workforce and it runs better than it ever did. So the U.S. is the most, you think you guys have a bloated government. The U.S. has got the most bloated, you know, overstaffed government and, by, you know, manned by lifers who just like are sitting there punching a the clock, collecting their insurances and social. 
if, if Musk can go in and do this and Trump can give him free hand to cut regulations, cut taxes, I think that those two, that the kind of push-pull puts the U.S. in a position where they have a budget surplus. Listen, you guys have a budget surplus now, right? Yes. Yeah, budget. So you, put, you imagine that on the scale of the U.S. economy. <laughs> you could have multi-trillion dollar year surpluses, okay, and start paying down the debt really fast. And that becomes the biggest success story in the history of the world. But the only thing I'm not sure about that is that no politician is talking about that, isn't it? So maybe, maybe the population in the U.S. is not really worried about you know, all these extra expenses that the government should do something about. To, don't you think so? I think people, I think um, intuitively, I would say most people in the U.S. with any sort of education or that are up on things, they're not just living, you know, some people, I guess, want to live and not care. They want to hide their head in the sand. But I think pretty much everyone in the U.S. knows is that the budget deficit is a massive problem. We have these big... Tickers, these clocks, like in, in okay. Times Square, where it's like you know, it's, it's co- you watch the budget, it's increasing, the deficit increasing every like second by like ten thousand dollars a second, and you're like, what the <laughs> hell, right? And it keeps it's like it's like a ticking time, and it gets faster and faster and faster until it explodes, right? So I think people know, um, and I think that there's sort of like even like you know myself, I'm like, you know, some point this is gonna have to work itself out. You know, maybe they should be issuing, you know, 100-year bonds and really kick the can down the road even <laughs> further, like much longer-term bonds or some of a 50-, 80-year bond. <laughs> I don't know. Like, that's one. But I, I, I think the solution to this, okay, it, it, you need to slash expenses. You know, right now, you know, the Biden administration touted, we created all these jobs. No, you didn't. Okay, there were bounce back jobs. Like after the pandemic, everyone was out of work, so people came back. Those aren't jobs. But the ones that were created, you know what they were? Government jobs. <laughs> they weren't real jobs created by private industry. And when you create a government job, that's not increasing productivity. That's the worst job of all because the government is so inefficient. In other words, it's not like it's like imagine, okay, let's do a split test. North Korea versus South Korea. <laughs> you know, East Germany versus West Germany. Which system works better? When there's the bloated big government, okay, I remember back, on, I visited the Czech Republic right before, right when it was privatizing, back in 93, 94, right? They were going from communist to capitalist, right? And I visited a company called Motokov, and they employed 120,000 people and needed 2,000 of them. <laughs> Because why? That was the communist way. Everyone has a job. Everyone's part of the government, right? And they had to cut like 198,000 or 200,000 plus thousand people from their workforce. And today, Motocoff's a very successful company. It's very successful, okay? So all these jobs that are being created in the U.S. by the government, I mean, there was part of this like build back better plan. What a joke. I mean, they spent $500 billion, I think so far, on, on infrastructure, like p- rolling out like um, um, high-speed internet to rural areas. And not one home has been... They lit up with internet. They've already like they probably already spent hundred billion dollars of that, and not one home. They have all these charging stations they're putting out. Not one charging station has been activated. Meanwhile, you could have used Tesla's Starlink to reach all these homes, and it would have been like no investment. But it was jobs created from all that money. That's taxpayer money that goes into to, to our deficit. So yeah, you created jobs, but you're increasing the deficit. That's not a way to build an economy or run an economy. 